Hey, Jeremy Hammond here, and in this video, I'm just going to respond to uh, an attempted rebuttal of an article I wrote, um, which was a response to Dr. Tom Cowan, who is a leading propagator of the claim that uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, does not exist. Um, to briefly summarize the backstory, I had given an interview some time ago with Brittany Schaffer, in which I described how you know the the this the virus SARS-CoV-2 has been whole genome sequenced um, and then Dr. Andrew Kaufman another leading propagator of the claim that the virus doesn't exist um, wrote an article responding to that interview of mine in which he made the claim that you can't sequence the whole genome of a virus without first purifying and isolating the virus um, so I pointed out in one of my newsletters that that's actually untrue, actually, that they have the technology to sequence the whole genome of multiple organisms <clears throat> at once, simultaneously, directly from a patient sample without first isolating each organism. Uh, and the, the term for that in the literature, it's, it's called metagenomic genomic sequencing, metagenomic sequencing. Um, and so this technology exists, and I just pointed that out. Uh, Dr. Tom Cowan then put out a video responding to that, um, <clears throat> essentially making the same false claims as uh, Andrew Kaufman, that, that you can't do that. And so I, I wrote this article. Uh, I published it just a few days ago. Uh, the title is Correcting Misinformation About SARS-CoV-2 Whole Genome Sequencing, published August 26th, um, in which I respond to Dr. Cohen's response to my response to Kaufman's response to my interview with with Brittany Schaffer um, so I just want to you know we'll sit and we'll we'll hear him out we'll we'll listen to what he has to say uh, we'll listen to his argument and then I just want to respond to it as we go along so let's just dive in so here's um here, here again is Tom Cowan responding to my article now the second thing and I am going to frankly admit that people did send me a paper apparently that Jeremy Hammond wrote this week or recently and I didn't read the whole paper I know of only one section and I thought it was very interesting uh his line of reasoning uh and so I know that I'm taking this out of context but I know also that he said this before uh so I wanted to just look at one line of reasoning he uses to prove the existence of the virus. Okay, so he's acknowledging he didn't read my article before trying to rebut it. He says he's aware of one section of the article. <clears throat> Which section is that? What's he talking about? What is he actually responding to? He doesn't actually identify it. Um, the, only, this, the most specific he gets is that he refers to um, a puzzle analogy that I've used. So in the original video, in the in interview I gave with Brittany Schaffer, uh, I used the analogy of a puzzle that you know, you can mix up all the pieces of the puzzle uh, and then reassemble them, and they only go back together one way. You know, each fit is unique, uh, and this is similar to whole genome sequencing, where it's you know um, they have made the claim that they, that scientists simply arbitrarily assemble the the genome, and that's that's not true. It's it's based on logic um, because <clears throat> you have various reads with these nucleotide sequences. Uh, and if you have, you know, if you have a sequence of 100 nucleotides, um, and, and then you have another sequence from the same organism, uh, you know, where there's an overlap, then you can, you know, you find those those areas of overlap, and eventually, by assem through assembly, you can you can assemble the whole the whole genome. Um, and so I was just using this puzzle analogy to kind of just illustrate that for readers who aren't familiar with the technology, uh, you know, just to try to make it simple for for my own readers to understand that it's not the case where they can, uh, as has been falsely claimed, that they simply, you know, you can assemble it however you want. And if you take the little pieces of, of uh, genetic materials and then you can assemble it to create whatever you want, this is untrue. So I was just pointing that out with the puzzle analogy. <clears throat> um, Tom and Dr. Cowan took issue with that in the last video, uh, which my article is a, you know, a response to. Uh, I just want to point out that I took the time to watch his his attempted rebuttal of, of my um, my newsletter, of what I'd said about, you know, to correct Andrew Kaufman's mistakes. Uh, and I took the time to carefully listen to his arguments, and I addressed each argument point by point in my article 
whereas uh, Colin can't even be bothered to read my article um, before attempting a rebuttal to it, uh, so I just find this to be intellectually lazy. Uh, so I'm going to point that out at first. So he admits he didn't read the article. He's going to try to rebut it. He's um, familiar with one point. The, the thing he's going to pull out of here is um, something related to the puzzle analogy, as you'll see. Let's continue. So because I haven't read the rest of the paper, I at this point have no comment. My impression was it was the same old thing, which we don't need to rehash. Okay. So he... Had a look at it. I don't, I don't know how he. I don't know how he arrived at the conclusion that it's the same old thing because um, it can't possibly be the same old thing because I had never written a rebuttal to those specific arguments of his before. Um, so this was something new. Uh, the article contains new new information, new arguments. Um, <clears throat> so it's not it's not the same old thing. So uh, you know, again, he's just lazily responding to maybe what he thinks I had said before, um, but he's not actually addressing anything I actually wrote in this article. And so you'll see that as we continue. I wanted to focus on this one uh, issue, which I think really gets to the heart of what I mean by foundational thinking and how he thinks. So the question is, what about metagenomic de novo unbiased sequencing? Is That is how they found, and that is how they found the first SARS-CoV-2. And that is the technique generally used to find a virus that's new for the first time. And that's a little redundant because if it's the first time, it's obviously new. So to find a new virus, and prove it exists. It's again, kind of conflating two terms here. <clears throat> one is metagenomic and one is de novo. Uh, he seems to, I, you know, he did this in his prior video where he used, the, he used the word metagenomic or de novo sequencing as though those are synonymous. In fact, they're two different things. So de novo sequencing is sequencing that's done without a reference genome. Um, so every, every reference genome had to have originally been de novo sequenced logically. Okay, metagenomic is different, um, although metagenomic sequencing is de novo sequencing. I mean, that's the application of it. Um, metagenomic simply means that you can actually se sequence multiple genomes simultaneously, and you can do this directly from a patient sample without first isolating each organism. This obviously poses a, a, an obstacle, a dilemma for their argument, because their whole argument centers around this claim that the virus has never been isolated, and therefore it's never been proven to exist. Well, whole genome sequence sequencing is independent of isolation in terms of proof of the existence of this virus. So we'll see here how he, how he deals with this. And that means you take unpurified material now, whether or not you put it in a centrifuge, that may be a purification step, but you don't have only virus. That's what every human being means when they say isolated, purified virus. Okay. Um, here he's going back to their chief argument about how the virus has never been isolated. This is really a semantic game. Um, when scientists say that the virus has been isolated, they mean they have isolated the virus from a patient sample. They've separated the virus from the patient, um, and they've characterized and identified the virus. Okay, that's what isolation means. In the scientific literature, this is what they mean. And the um, the typical, the, the, the actually what they call the gold standard of virus isolation is the use of cell culture. So viruses require cells, they require host cells to replicate. And so a typical process would be to, you know, you would take a patient sample, and then you... Um, you centrifuge the, the sample, you take the supernatant, and you uh, inoculate uh, one cell culture with a supernatant. You, you inoculate a second cell culture. Um, that's a control culture. <clears throat> so you have the infected uh, uh, cell culture and the uninfected control. Uh, and then you watch for cytopathic effects in replication, in viral replication in, in the cell culture. Um, so this is what scientists mean when they describe um, isolation. Now, Kaufman and Cowan, they take issue with that because they say, well, if you're putting it in a cell culture, you're not completing, completely separating the virus from everything else. And they, they 
rely on a dictionary definition. So they have this layperson's dictionary definition of what the word isolation means. Um, and, and so they reject what scientists mean by the technical term of isolation. You know, we need to understand isolation according to what they mean by it, not according to what Cowan says it should be, you know, not according to what Kaufman says it should be. It's, it's, it is what it is. I mean, it's, it's essentially they have a problem with scientists using technical language that isn't the same as layperson's understanding. But, you know, pick your, pick your profession. You're going to find technical language that doesn't match exactly, you know, um, lay people's uh, vernacular use of, of terms. So, you know, the fact that scientists use isolation in a way that doesn't mean, you know, that, that the virus is completely separated from everything else as though you could, uh, you know, suspend the virus in a vacuum for observation. Um, yeah, they don't mean that. Uh, so, you know, but we should understand what scientists mean. So this, this goes back to that whole, that whole point. And, um, uh, let's just, let's just continue here with his argument. So everybody agrees they didn't have that. They put a lot of stuff from lung fluid and they put it into some sort of apparatus and they chopped it up into little bits and they ended up with something like 56 million pieces of RNA. And so this was chopped up and made into a so-called library and then it was assembled into a genome. And this became the model for the first SARS-CoV-2 genome, which then uh, gave rise to all the other models. And it gave rise to, it was the essentially the root of the phylogenetic tree, which uh, Lyons-Weiler talks about. Okay, so he's referring to Dr. James Lyons-Weiler there. <clears throat> um, so he's acknowledging here, uh, he mentioned the phylogenetic tree, which I discussed in my article. So. Um, what they can do is, you know, when you map, when you sequence the whole genome of multiple, you know, many, many different isolates of SARS-CoV-2, and then you can map those, those genomic sequences. So you can see the ancestral relationship between different variants and different, you know, different mutations of the virus. Um, and that's called a phylogenetic tree. You can think of it like, a, like a, as I explained in my article, you know, it's basically like the family tree of the virus. And so he's acknowledging, you know, this, the existence of <laughs> this ability, uh, uh, you know, that they have this phylogenetic tree. So this is hugely important to see whether this process of taking 56 million pieces of genetic material from many different sources, uh, chopping it up, and assembling it in the computer by the computer matching overlapping pieces can actually come up with the genome of an organism which has never been found before. Okay, so this is the key point here. He's, he's expressing skepticism about the existence of metagenomic sequencing. Um, he, he's and as I'll go on to argue that that essentially it doesn't exist. You can't do it. You can't do metagenomic sequencing, as he just alluded to. This is the question: Can they do that? Um, so we'll see that he's going to argue that you can't do that. And the point I wanted to bring up is that Hammond compared this to well, of course, if you took a puzzle and let's say fifty million puzzle pieces and you put them on the table and you gave them to a computer, you could, the computer or a good puzzle person, and I don't know that he said how many pieces there were in the beginning, but the computer or you, the puzzle master, could find the picture of the mastodon in those pieces. And that proves that you can find the genome because the pieces of the mastodon would fit properly, the colors would match, and then through looking through it and assembling it in according to the rules of assembly of a puzzle or a genome, you would come out with the picture of a mastodon or the genome. Okay, he's essentially, you know, I don't have too many quibbles here with his characterization of either my puzzle analogy or, or what whole genome sequencing is. Um, that's correct. So you essentially, 
you know, you can, just like with a puzzle, you know, you could mix up the pieces and you know, they only assemble back together one way. Each piece is unique. Each piece only fits one other piece. Um, so it's not the case, and, and the reason why I use this puzzle analogy to begin with, way back in the, that interview with uh, Brittany Schaffer, uh, is because, you know, there was this claim that they, they simply um, randomly assemble, you know, you just arbitrarily assemble uh, um, genetic materials, nucleotide sequences, to create whatever they want, and they can just take the, the whatever original genetic material and, and assemble it into SARS-CoV-2 and essentially just manufacture and fabricate that sequence, <clears throat> which isn't the case at all. It's just a complete misunderstanding of how genomic sequencing works. Um, so I use the puzzle analogy just to try to simplify it and, get, and give a simple illustration, um, uh, you know, uh, of what genomic assembly is, um, where you have overlapping sequences of nucleotides. If you have, a, you know, a, for example, a hundred nucleotide base pair long um, DNA sequence, uh, and then you have additional, you know, sequences, and there's overlaps between them. Well, you know, you have those unique regions that overlap, so that's how you know they go together. Um, the same as like with a puzzle, you have unique pieces that, that fit together because the cut of the puzzle is, is a certain way and the colors and the shapes, you know, the image of the puzzle only get, go together a certain way. Um, so it's not the case that they can just assemble it arbitrarily, randomly, um, you know, and essentially just fabricating it whole cloth. It, it, it's, it's, it's logical. It's computational. Um, so it, it seems to me, you know, he's, he's kind of fairly characterizing that, that that is what genomic sequencing is. But as you'll see here momentarily, he's, he's going to question um, whether scientists can do that. So let's think about this for a minute. Here we have a situation, if you use the analogy, where nobody has ever seen a mastodon before. In fact, we have no idea whether a mastodon exists or not, obviously, because it's the first time we're looking for it. We don't know what color it is. We don't know what shape it is. We don't know anything about it. All we have are these puzzle pieces. So you tell the computer to find the mastodon. Okay, that's incorrect. <clears throat> um, you wouldn't tell the computer what to find. Um, you know, we're talking about metagenomic sequencing here specifically. If scientists don't tell the computer what genome to find. You know, they might not know. It's in there. For example, I give an, the example of, of one use of metagenomic sequencing. Um, scientists um, wanted to characterize the virome, the gut virome. And so they used metagenomic sequencing to identify uh, over 140,000 different viruses in the human gut. They didn't know what they were going to find. They didn't tell the computer what to find. They didn't tell it what to look for. They just used the technology um, to assemble the genetic material of the viruses and other microorganisms, um, you know, in these samples from from from, from human gut. Um, and then it is what it is. I mean, you, th those those pieces of genetic material only uh, could assemble, uh, you know, in one way. Um, and it's, it's, you, you know, to kind of extend the analogy of a puzzle, you could take, you know, 10 different puzzles and mix all the pieces up together and you could still reassemble the puzzles and each puzzle is only going to go back together one way. You're not going to, you know, have a puzzle of a, a hippo and an elephant and a, and a rhino uh, and, and, you know, mix them up and reassemble them and come out with, a, you know, a picture of a mastodon. It's just that's you're going to still come out with the three original puzzles. Um, and you could do this, of course, obviously. Um, without having ever seen the box cover of, of the puzzle. You can assemble puzzles without knowing what it is you're gonna, going to be assembling. <clears throat> um, so it's not correct that you know they tell the computer what to find uh, in the case of metagenomic um, sequencing. And my guess is what the computer or the puzzle master would do is it would assemble the pieces uh, into whatever shape, form, color pieces fit together. My guess is it would come out with tens, hundreds, thousands, maybe even a hundred thousand, if you started with 50 million different puzzle pieces of pictures 
that all fit together in their own way. Okay, this is an important point here because he's actually changed his argument from, from the prior video of his. In this previous video, he claimed that you can, you can um, assemble the, the genetic material in a million different ways. Um, you notice here he's actually saying that you can, you can have you know, the outcome of multiple pictures, each only assembled, can only be assembled in that one way. That's correct. Um, this is a correction I made in my article. Um, so he's actually uh, more accurately characterizing genetic sequencing in this instance compared to the last video that I responded to. Um, but notice he's not acknowledging his error. He's correcting it, but he didn't acknowledge um, the error that he made in the prior video. So I just wanted to point that out that, you know, I, I did correct that in, in my article. I don't know whether he read that part of my article, and that's what's prompted him to um, more accurately explain it this time rather than misinforming. Um, but it's just, it's just worth noting that he's actually um, correcting an error he made before. Okay, so now you have, let's say, 500,000 different pictures because these different puzzle pieces fit together, this group fit together, this group fit together, this group fit together. So you have 500,000 different pictures. So here's the central foundational question. How are you going to decide which is the real mastodon? Okay, so the question is, so you notice he, he, up to this point, he's essentially acknowledged that, yes, uh, you, if you're starting with, um, you know, multiple organisms, uh, viruses, organisms, <clears throat> you, you know, those, the, their genomic sequences are only going to be assembled in one way. So you, you so you might come out, you know, if there's 500,000, you just use his number, 500,000 different organisms in a sample, and you do metagenomic sequencing, you're going to come up with 500,000 different pictures um, to stick with the analogy. So um, that aspect of it is correct. There's 500,000 pictures. As acknowledged, each only assembled in that one way. Um, again, correct. Um, no, but now he's now he's asking the question, well, how do you know which one is the mastodon? In other, in other words, I think that what he means is which one caused the patient's symptoms. Well, this is really a different question. You know, the, the question of whether SARS-CoV-2 causes COVID-19 is a different question from whether SARS-CoV-2 exists. And in my article, I deal strictly, uh, although, although I do touch on the issue of causality and, and the pathogenicity of SARS-CoV-2, um, my primary purpose was just to demonstrate and to show how uh, scientists can do whole genome sequencing without having first isolated the virus. Um, and that the whole genome sequencing is itself a proof of the existence of the virus. Um, but so he, so the question of whether it actually caused the patient's uh, illness is, is a different question. Um, but when they did this, you know, when they first did this sequencing, this metagenomic sequencing from patient samples in Wuhan, um, they did not at that point. I mean, just because they found a coronavirus in these patients doesn't mean that that proved that the uh, that that coronavirus caused their symptoms later on of course they did establish that SARS-CoV-2 is a pathogenic virus it, do, it does cause symptoms of disease it's a necessary but insufficient factor in the pathogenesis of COVID-19 um, however again we're, with, at this point in the argument we're just dealing with whether the virus exists or not um, and so you know he's kind of bringing up this question of well how do they know which one of those 500,000, you know, or whatever, you know, because they, again, metagenomic sequencing, they're finding all kinds of things in the sample. Um, but so how do you know which one is the thing you're looking for? Um, so it, it, there is an answer to that question uh, in terms of how they determined, you know, which one of those genetic sequences that was the outcome of the metagenomic sequencing, which one of those sequences was likely or possibly uh, an explanation for the patient's symptoms. There is an answer to that question, but first, let's just see what he says about it. Think about that for a minute, everybody. Which is the real one? You have no reference, Master. Okay, so he's asking, which is the real one? Well, they're all real. There's no, there's not one that's real and the rest are all fake. 
So he's using language here that doesn't even make sense. Um, they're all real. Every, you know, you know, metagenomic sequencing doesn't give results of organisms that are fake. They're all real. So yeah, there is there there is an important question of okay, well, do any of those organisms <clears throat> might any of those possibly explain this patient's symptoms? Okay, that's the question we want to ask here, and there's an answer to it. They did very reasonably determine that one of those was uh, a possible cause of the patient's symptoms. But again, let's just see what Cohen says about this. Nobody has ever seen a mastodon. You don't know whether a mastodon has trunks, hair, fur. You don't know whether it's six feet tall, 100 feet tall. You, the, you or the computer has no reference, no standard. And so you can't possibly, and I would emphasize this, you can't possibly choose which is the right mastodon and be correct because you have no idea which one is correct because there's nothing to, there's no standard to compare it with. Okay, this is just simply wrong. Um, so when they did the metagenomic sequencing on the patients in Wuhan, um, who were presented with symptoms of, of you know, what appeared to be a, a kind of a novel respiratory disease, um, they, they're, they're, it says, you know, you have no point of reference, which is untrue. Of course, they, they have a point of reference. So we, again, looking at the, the phylogenetic tree. So what they did is it turned out that the longest one of those sequences that they found in the sample, again, looking at the very first paper, um, the very longest one uh, happened to be very highly abundant in the sample. So that's one, high abundance. Um, and two, uh, they mapped the whole genome of it. They, they sequenced the whole genome and they, they did a phylogenetic analysis and, and they determined that it was um, a SARS-like coronavirus. So there's a, a species of coronavirus <clears throat> that are capable of binding to the ACE2 receptor, um, meaning that you know potentially they, they can infect humans um, because that's how you know SARS, SARS-CoV-2. That's how they infect humans. Is, is the spike protein of the of the virus binds to the ACE2 receptor, and they use that as the entryway into the cells. Um, so there, there's an, actually a name for the you know there's the species of the coronaviruses that have this um, capability. That's the species. They they identified the genus. It's a it's a beta coronavirus. So because of the phylogenetic tree and the you know the existing database of coronaviruses that they have, they were able to say, yes, this is a coronavirus. It belongs to this species. It belongs to this genus. Um, and so they did have a point of reference. They did have a, a frame of reference for me to be able to say, okay, well, look, <clears throat> we've got this patient sample. We've done metagenomic sequencing. Here we have this, the, the longest sequence um, happens to be, um, uh, there's a lot of it in the sample. It's in high abundance. And we, we have identified it as a coronavirus. Um, it's a SARS-like coronavirus. It belongs to the species of coronavirus that is capable of binding to ACE2. So, they, I mean, that's plenty of reason. Um, that's a reasonable basis to make the judgment that this could very well be the cause of the patient's symptoms. Now, they didn't prove that. That's not the point, but they did prove that it exists. That's the point. Um, and so let's just continue with his argument. The only way you could do that is if you already knew what a mastodon is, and then you could tell the computer to find the mastodon and may or may not be able to do that. Okay, well, they, they already know what coronaviruses are. So there you go. But here, we don't know uh, what a mastodon is or even whether it exists. So it's, again, just flat out wrong is simply incorrect. Uh, again, he's, he's going on this point about how they have no frame of reference, but they do. Um, so that's how they were able to identify SARS-CoV-2 as a the possible or probable pathogen, you know, that could explain the, the symptoms in the patient. So by definition, using logic, reason, and science, you cannot use this to find in an unbiased de novo way the existence of a new organism. So there you have it. There's his claim. Uh, if you think about what he's claiming is that metagenomic de novo sequencing does not exist. You can't do it. Scientists don't have that capability. He's saying you cannot, <laughs> you, 
you cannot sequence the whole genome uh, of multiple organisms simultaneously directly from a patient sample and then identify a new virus um, from that process. Well, it's, it's, again, it's just flat out wrong. It's incorrect. They can do that. Uh, and, and, you know, they can identify based on the genome sequence, whether it's a bacteria, a fungus, parasite, a virus, uh, they can separate the human, you know, in, in these samples, or again, they're, if you're taking it directly from a patient sample, a lot of the genetic material is from the patient. Well, they know <laughs> what genetic material is human or not. They know what's self or non-self. Um, so they can tell a lot from the genomes, including, you know, like, again, what type of virus is it? It's a coronavirus. What species? Well, it's, uh, it's, it belongs to the species of coronavirus that are capable of binding to ACE2. What's the, you know, what's the family? What's the genus? Like, they're able to do this. Um, and he's simply denying, he's simply saying that they don't have that capability, which is, it's just incorrect. You have to have a standard. If we compare this to what they actually did, it's very similar to what I said. They put 56 million pieces in. They put it in two computers. I don't remember the exact numbers. The computer spits out you know, something like hundreds of thousands of different genomes varying in size. Uh, the other uh, software came out with fewer uh, possible genomes, but let's say hundreds of thousands. So how do you know which is the right one? How do you know which is the right mastodon? I use this example in my book. How do you know which one is King Beauregard's castle if you have no idea if King Beauregard even had a castle. Okay, so again, he, he's just denying that there's a frame of reference for, for, for scientists to be able to identify from, from these patient samples potential pathogens. I mean, they, you know, they were looking, they weren't specifically looking for a coronavirus. You know, they were looking like, is there a bacteria? Is there viruses in the sample? You know, what could potentially explain? You know, and then they, they happened to find a, a very, you know, prominent suspect <laughs> because of the nature of its genetic sequence and how that defined the organism. Um, so they did have frame of reference. Uh, and so it's not the case that they have no frame of reference. The answer is there's no way. So how did they do it? Well, they took the longest of the contig, so-called sequences, and they said, that must be the one because they compared it to the previous SARS virus, which by the way, was found in the exact same way. So this keeps pushing the problem back. Uh, and so it's not 89% similar. And so it must be a SARS virus because uh, that's the longest one. And anyways, we think the person has SARS sort of like the 2003. And so it must be. Okay, well, there's nothing unreasonable. <laughs> he's, he's describing this as though that's unreasonable um, that what they did, they, first of all, the length was, they didn't pick it because it was the longest one. They didn't say, oh, because this is the longest one, therefore it's probably the cause of the, of the patient's symptoms. It just so happens that the longest um, contig, the longest sequence from that metagenomic sequencing analysis was in very high abundance in the sample. Again, it was in very high abundance in the sample. That's a clue. That's evidence. Also, again, he, they did have a frame of reference, which is all the, the database of known coronaviruses, including the original SARS, as well as other SARS-like coronaviruses belonging to the same species. Um, and so there's nothing unreasonable or impossible about that. It makes perfect sense that they said, okay, well, this is a SARS-like coronavirus. Well, gee, um, you know, and we already know that, that SARS back in 2003 was causing disease in people. So gosh, I mean, it, it's quite obvious why they would have selected that as the, as the primary suspect, as their key suspect. Um, it, that's not, you know, he's talking about that as though like that's unreasonable or something. Uh, or impossible, but it makes perfect sense. Let's continue. And I think anybody who looks at this logically and rationally will say, 
That is no way to prove the existence of anything. Well, I can't agree with that statement. Um, you know, I think his conclusion here that it's not a reasonable, rational, logical way to go about it, um, I think I think that's premised on his claim that he made there that, you know, essentially they're committing scientific fraud here when they're sequencing the genome and they're kind of arbitrarily picking one of these um sequences and saying oh that's that's the cause of the patient's symptoms but it's not arbitrary it's not arbitrary at all um and he's saying well and so and then he's acknowledging that yes they had a frame of reference they compared it to other um, coronaviruses um but he's saying that you know when they sequenced other coronaviruses like the original SARS that you know that was also essentially scientific fraud an arbitrary assemblage and it's just it's just incorrect it's simply factually wrong um and so if you if you acknowledge that yes they have the capability to sequence whole genomes um and they have done this with other coronaviruses and they have a database of of coronaviruses including uh, you know ones belonging to the same genus the beta coronaviruses SARS like coronaviruses um, so you know it makes sense that they said okay well this is this is related to those viruses and so it makes sense that this could potentially be the cause of the patient's symptoms it's very logical it's very scientific and when he claims it's not it's simply a, a, an anti-factual argument now to top it off and the reason I talked about the re reproducibility crisis in science and medicine is Stefan actually sent the raw data, meaning these 56 million pieces of RNA, to a mathematician who knows how to do the sequencing. And interestingly, he couldn't come up with the sequence that they chose, right? They chose a sequence. They chose the longest one. They chose the one that was an 89% match that does not prove that it exists because that sequence was nowhere in the sample. Okay, again, he's, <laughs> I, this is a nonsensical argument. It's complete nonsense that it was never in the sample to begin with. He's claiming the virus was never in the sample to begin with. Well, yes, it was. That's how they were able to sequence its whole genome. It was there. Otherwise they could have found it with gel electrophoresis. This was assembled and they used the template of the first SARS-1, which was also made in the exact same way with no reference. So it's best to understand his argument here. He's essentially saying that they just, they had a fabricated virus before. They used that as a template to now fa fabricate a new coronavirus. Um, well, I mean, he's welcome to make that claim, but it's simply untrue. Uh, they didn't fabricate it it wasn't arbitrary they didn't arbitrarily arbitrarily select it it did exist it was in the patient sample that's how they were able to, to sequence the whole genome and it made sense how they were how they identified it as uh as possibly having caused these patients symptoms it's all very scientific it's all very logical it all makes perfect sense um is kaufman there's uh, sorry not kaufman's but Cowan's arguments here who uh, that don't make sense and they're unscientific and essentially it's science denialism. He's denying even the very existence of essentially, if, if you want to follow his argument through to its logical corollary, he's claiming that whole, uh, that whole genome sequencing, that de novo, that whole genome sequencing is a hoax. The technology doesn't exist, which is curious because in, in Kaufman and Cowan's statement on virus isolation um, that they have published, they acknowledge the, uh, the validity of Whole genome sequencing. They say scientists have this capability to, to, to do whole genome sequencing and they acknowledge it. Um, so it's a self-contradictory argument. He's not even consistent with himself. So, uh, but the problem of the reproducibility is you couldn't even reproduce the genome that he used without adding some sequences and fudging it and rearranging things. And so it turns out that even the sequence that they finally chose couldn't be reproduced. Well, I don't know what he's talking about here with Stephen Lanka, but I can tell you, the you know, again, scientists independently all around the world have sequenced the whole genome 
of SARS-CoV-2. I mean, there's a databases, which is hundreds of thousands of different um, published genomic sequences. It's not a hoax. They're not fabricating it. And you, I mean, to, to, to believe what he, what Colin is arguing here, you have to believe that a virtually the entire scientific community is is perpetrating a deliberate hoax. Well, good luck explaining that one. I mean, he. he, he he doesn't have an alternative hypothesis to better explain all of the available evidence. Now, again, uh, uh, Mr. Hammond has two options here in order to go on. One is to say his example is incorrect. There is no possible way that unbiased de novo metagenomic sequencing can find the genome, can prove the existence of a new organism. Okay. He's claiming that I'm wrong. He's claiming that essentially that, okay, the, the argument is metagenomic sequencing can't find the genetic sequence of a new organism. Well, so in other words, metagenomic sequencing doesn't exist, can't exist, because that's what metagenomic sequencing is. I mean, that's the principal purpose of it. That's its, uh, it's, 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 chief utility uh, um, and, and so in my article I cited the literature ex explaining what metagenomic sequencing is what they can do with it how they can use it to simultaneously sequence um, genomes of multiple organisms in parallel directly from samples that's what it is so you know I mean <laughs> he can deny the existence of this technology all he wants it's right there in the scientific literature. I provided him with the liter literature. You know, denying science is not the same as producing an argument. You know, when I when I make when I make arguments against mandatory vaccination, for example, you know, I do it by citing the scientific literature. <laughs> I don't do it by saying, "Oh, well, we can just ignore all of the scientific literature. We can just dismiss it." No, I, I cite the science to support my arguments, and my and, my, and to support my counter arguments against public vaccine policy I get the skepticism there but like when, when you have to dismiss literally the entire body of relevant literature that it's not a reasonable argument I mean I can cite scientific literature to support what I'm saying to support yeah metagenomic sequencing exists it's a real technology they really can do those things with it you know yes yes they have isolated the virus uh, in cell culture you know that's what isolation means that's what they refer to as isolation they have done that they do have that ability you know I mean I can cite studies um, discussing these things I mean they can't cite Cohen and his colleagues Kaufman and, and the rest of them claiming that the virus doesn't exist they can't cite a single paper in the scientific literature to actually support their claims to the contrary now that's not to say that they don't cite scientific literature to try to support their arguments. It's just that if you actually go and read those studies, they don't say, they don't actually support their arguments as an example, you know, citing a study to say, oh, well, you know, the, the authors of this study said that you can't tell the difference between viruses and exosomes. Um, actually, the study showed that, you know, they describe how scientists are able to distinguish between viruses and exosomes, and the authors of the study acknowledge, you know, that SARS-CoV-2 exists. Um, so, you know, they might cite papers, but the papers don't actually support their position. And that's what I mean when I say, you know, I, I cite scientific literature to support what I'm saying. You know, you can go check out the studies you, and read about metagenomic sequencing in the literature for yourself and see that it, this technology exists and that they really can do this with this technology. And here comes along Tom Cowan to say, no, that it doesn't exist. Well, okay, well, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, it's a very lazy argument you know you, you have to demonstrate okay if you want to if you want to demonstrate that I mean so now you're essentially claiming you're making a positive claim at this point that metagenomic sequencing is a hoax that it doesn't really exist that they can't really do those things well okay if you're gonna make that positive claim you need to produce an argument to support it you know can you cite any literature that calls into question the existence of metagenomic sequencing it doesn't exist you can't cite any supporting date in any supporting um, literature to support this claim and the non-existence of this technology um, and you notice he, he doesn't come out and say well this technology doesn't exist but he's claiming it can't do what what it is I mean metagenomic sequencing is 
that ability it is the technology that enables scientists to do just that, to do precisely the thing he's saying that can't be done. So essentially, in, in essence, in effect, he's denying the existence of this technology. Well, okay. It simply isn't equipped to do that. Or he can do and or show me a proper study, same thing, where you take 10 people you say has COVID, 10 people with other problems, you take their fluid, you do the metagenomic sequencing on both, and show me the exact genome uh, that all the co the the SARS-CoV-2 genomes are identical, and none of the SARS-CoV-2 genomes are found in the people who have lung cancer or kidney problems or have nothing. Okay, well, first of all, they wouldn't be identical necessarily because, of course, the virus mutates, um, and so there are going to be differences. And this is again it goes back to the phylogenetic tree and how they can map actually the evolutionary path of the, of the virus based on the mutations that occur um, in the genetic sequence of the virus. So it's it's not the case that they would all be exactly the same. Uh, of course, they would be very similar to each other. You know, ninety nine percent similarity, ninety nine point nine percent similarity, something like this. Um, which is the case in, in in you know if you look at the study again that I cite in my article. Uh, where they had uh, at the same time the, the very first whole genome sequencing uh, metagenomic sequencing um, paper was published and then there was another paper, paper published the same day in the same journal um, that corroborated their findings of a novel coronavirus in patients um, who presented with symptoms of what they now call COVID-19 um, so <laughs> you know they've done this uh, and of course, people by definition, anyone who doesn't have a SARS-CoV-2 infection by definition doesn't have COVID-19. Of course, I'm very well aware of how they were using PCR tests um, to diagnose people with COVID-19, even if they weren't in infected, even if that test did not represent an active infection. Um, that's a completely separate issue. We're not going to confuse these two issues. We're talking here about whole genome sequencing, not how PCR tests were used to perpetrate systematic scientific fraud. So when I'm talking about how, by definition, uh, you know, the infection with the virus, uh, by definition, anyone who's not infected with the virus doesn't have COVID-19. Okay, and so yes, you can take healthy people and 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 take a sample from them and do metagenomic sequencing on them and they're not going to find SARS-CoV-2 because they don't have an infection. Um, and you take somebody who's sick, who has symptoms uh, of COVID-19, do the sequencing, you might find it's caused by something else. You might find it's caused by an influenza virus or some other virus that, that could possibly explain the symptoms. There might be some other cause of the symptoms. Um, but you know, you, 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 they can, they did, and they did do that. They did rule out, they looked for any pathogens in these samples. They didn't just say, oh, we're going to look for a coronavirus. They looked for anything that could possibly explain the symptoms. They found a coronavirus. So it, it made sense for them to, to suggest that that could be the cause of COVID-19. And that would prove, or at least demonstrate that this is a valid way and it would have to be blinded and controlled. And friends, this is exactly what our viral challenge is proposing. All right, that's enough. So essentially he's giving me a choice. Like if I want to continue in good faith, I either have to admit that I'm wrong, that they can't identify a new virus with metagenomic de novo sequencing, or I should get on board with their uh, their endeavor here with this uh, proposal that they that they have um, for an experiment. Well, it, those are not my choices. I don't have to either admit I'm wrong or get on board with their, you know, or go out and do this study or or cite some study. Um, you know, I've cited all the evidence I need to cite um, to support my argument that metagenomic sequencing is real. It exists. They really can identify new organisms using this technology. It's that simple. He's denying that. Well, willful ignorance isn't an argument. 
Um, so that's that. You know, I, I think it's really instructive here that how he, you know, attempts to at the end of his um, little, uh, you know, what he claims to be a rebuttal. That he doesn't actually rebut anything I say. Um, where he kind of says, you know, if we're going to continue this dialogue and this back and forth, you know, that f for me to demonstrate good faith, I have to admit I'm wrong, or, or you know, like get on board with this um, project of theirs. Well, no, I don't have to do either of those things because I'm not wrong. Um, I'm correct. I'm right. Metagenomic sequencing exists, and they can identify new viruses using that technology. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, Cowan is, is trying to call me out and say what I need to do to demonstrate good faith um, when he has so um, clearly illustrated bad faith himself. I mean, he didn't even read my article before attempting to rebut it He's, by his own admission by his, by his own account he took what I was saying oh, with the puzzle analogy quote out of context okay well fair enough he, he's admitting that he's not trying to conceal that it's just you know um, you know if you're gonna talk to me about what I need to do to, to demonstrate good faith you could you could demonstrate a little bit of good faith yourself you know you could read my article before attempting to rebut it, you could see how I addressed each and every one of your arguments in detail, point by point. You know, I showed Colin the respect of actually listening to his arguments and then producing a detailed response to his claims. Um, you know, this to me seems to have demonstrated good faith on my part. Um, I didn't level personal attacks. You know, I didn't. I didn't argue against what he's saying. Based, you know, I didn't, wasn't calling him names and things. I said, well, he, this is what he's claiming. Here's why that's logically fallacious, or here's why that's factually incorrect. And I cited, uh, I cited the documentation to support what I was saying. I cited the literature. Um, he's not doing that. He's not citing any literature here. He's not citing anything. He's not citing any sources to support his argument. He's essentially claiming that metagenomic sequencing doesn't exist, or nonsensically claiming that it exists but it can't identify new um, viruses or organisms um, which makes no sense whatsoever it's a nonsensical argument um, and, and uh, so you know it's 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 telling to me what poor faith he has demonstrated what bad faith he has demonstrated in producing this attempted rebuttal um, while having the hypocrisy to make suggestions to me about what I need to do to demonstrate good faith. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's that.